Hey, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. And this is my top 10 solo games of all time. A long, long time ago, like three years-ish around, three years, maybe two and a half, three, I think three, I think three, I'll double check. A long, long time ago, I put out a video of my top 10 solo games of all time. And there were a lot of games in that video, more than 10, as you would expect from any video. Don't worry, there are more than 10 in this video too. But it's been a long time since then. And things have changed, my opinions have changed. I have, I figured it's time to redo that video. So here, uh, here we are in 2023, and I'm going to be doing my top 10 solo games of all time as of 2023. Now, a few caveats, a few things to just in general be aware of whatnot. First of all, this list will inherently have more than 10 games because why in the world not? Uh, secondly is I've pivoted a bit. Like for example, one, one example offhand is a game like uh, Gloomhaven. Gloomhaven was in my top 10 solo games of all time. And I don't think in hindsight, I would have done that. I don't know why I did. I'd have to think back to Alex three years ago and what my thought process was, because Gloomhaven is a game that can be played solo, but it's not a game that I typically play solo. I've done it. I have played Gloomhaven solo, but it's not one that I typically play solo. It's not my go-to. It's not my preference. And so when I think of my top 10 solo games, I'm not looking for games that can be played solo or that I occasionally dive into solo. I'm looking into, I'm looking for games that not just are they great games, but they are great games solo. And I don't view solo as a step down. I view it as either the primary way, the only way. So either the only way, the primary way, or an exact equal way to playing it competitively. That's what I want for my top 10 solo games this time around. I feel like I other disclaimers. Oh, past that, if you look at the uh, list from three years ago, I think there's like four games that overlap. I have to check. Maybe it's three, maybe four. I think, I think it's three or four games that overlap. But we'll we'll go ahead and dive into it. And let's let's actually take that opportunity to go ahead and dive into it. Starting off as usual with our bonus picks. I have two bonus picks, and they're both here for two different reasons. The first bonus pick is going to be a Teneris Adventures. I am loving Teneris Adventures, and it's a game that I've spent easily sixty hours on. Sixty if I played it. Maybe maybe forty to sixty. I play. I spent somewhere between forty to sixty hours playing Tenaris Adventures solo this year alone. Well, I say this year alone, but I think it would have to be this year. I don't think I had access to it last year. So this year, this year I played Tenaris Adventures over forty to sixty hours, most of which has been solo. And this is a bonus pick for two reasons. The first is that I think I would prefer to play Tenaris Adventures not solo. I think. I've played it not solo. The only problem is I've only played it not solo with players who don't yet know the system as well. I haven't played it with somebody who really knows how to play properly, like who like who's fully like who has played like you know five ten hours under their belt. I've only played it with teaching new players, and so I don't know where I am in terms of preferring it solo or not solo as far as that goes. But it definitely is eligible just from the sheer amount that I enjoy it. The fact that I've given it a five out of five, and I've given it a five out of five primarily based on solo play, and so that is enough for it to be in the list. Which means the second reason, though, the second reason it's a bonus pick as opposed to directly in the pick, directly in the in the list, is that I am currently engaged in a, a full paid campaign playthrough with Dragori Games, where I'm going through the entire campaign, but it is paid content, and I'm a drop hesitant to throw this into my top ten solo games of all time. I, I'm not saying I wouldn't be willing to. But I'm a drop hesitant, and so instead I'm giving it a bonus pick slot uh, because it is definitely it's definitely eligible. It's definitely eligible, and so from there we're going to go ahead and give it a bonus pick instead, just uh, because I'm doing a decent amount of paid content around the games, and I'm not guaranteeing that I'll never in the future include something that might have paid content. I don't know for sure, but because I'm actively in middle of that engagement, I'm actively in middle of going through that. I'm a little hesitant to so so understand. I love this game. I recommend this game. It is here for a reason, but we're going to put it as a bonus pick. My second bonus pick, on the other hand, is Mage Knight. Mage Knight is a game that I keep trying to get rid of, and I will not let myself do so. Every time I pull this off the shelf, I look at the back of the box, and I pull off the shelf to get rid of, I look at the back of the box, and then I realize to myself that it doesn't matter how rarely I table this game, I want to love this game. I want to sit down and do what I've been doing with Tenaris Adventures. Tenaris Adventures, I love the game. I played it a lot, and now I know how to play. Done. I have it locked under my belt. I get mistakes wrong, make no mistake, but I can, I can enjoy the game system. I know it well enough that I can play it. Mage Knight, I only ever play it one game at a time, then give it five months, and then come back to it, and I keep doing that cycle, so there's just 12 months between plays, and that means that I haven't locked this in, and so every time I play it, it's like, I have to mentally prep myself, I have to get back ready to where it was, but when you do so, no differently than playing Tennis Adventures, when you do play Mage Knight, it can give you a three, four hour long experience of just pure satisfaction as you engage in the RPG adventure. And you can play it more than two players as well, and more than one player as well. You can play it uh, non-solo. For me, I've only ever played this game solo. I haven't felt the need to dive into it with more players. I don't feel comfortable enough. I barely feel comfortable enough teaching myself yet, and so I'm still a little bit away from being completely ready for Mage Knight. I don't play it enough. 
It's not on this list for a reason. But I don't feel comfortable. I think it was on my list. I think it was on my list last year. I'd have to double check. No, not last year. Three years ago. But I'd have to double check. But it is a great game. And when you table it, every time I table it, like this is the kind of game where if I ever play this game and after playing it, I'm ready to get rid of it, I'm okay with that. But I am only ever willing to get rid of it when I haven't played it in 12 months. And then I play it and I'm like, this game can't go anywhere. And so for right now, Mage Knight continues to stay around, but it's not going to be in the top 10 because I'm not playing enough. Barely at all. Which means to the top 10 list, and yes, there's still more than 10 games on this top 10 list, but we'll, we'll give expl explanations as to why. But starting off with our number 10 pick. And the number 10 pick is one that I think arguably would be a bit higher, but I've gone through the entire set of solo challenges, and that's going to be Calico. Calico, Cascadia, and Virgin all fall into a similar vein here, but I do think Calico is the best of the three for me, and so that's the one that I'm picking as the clear winner. Calico is a tile laying game. It's a game which you're going to be trying to place tiles onto these little patchwork areas, and every time you place a tile, you're trying to do so to be mindful of a few different things. First of all, depending on the pattern, you might get bonus cats. Depending on the color and putting together groups of colors, you'll get bonus buttons. And depending on the scoring objectives in play, you are trying to be mindful of how you orchestrate the tiles around certain buttons in the uh, pattern that you're building. The solo play has two ways of playing. The first is simply try to get as many points as you can, and the second is giving you 10 challenges that start off with hard and go all the way up to as hard as you can possibly imagine. There are 10 separate challenges that give you things you have to do along the way. It's not just about getting points. It's about doing this, this, and this and getting points. It's about getting one of each button and getting points. It's about getting three cats and getting points. It gives you these different things you're trying to be mindful of as you go through it, different goals you have to achieve, but you still have to get points. You can't just do the goals, and so you're trying to balance two different things, being well suited on points, but going for specific ways of getting points as opposed to anything else. And they are hard, they are challenging, they're enjoyable. So far, it's my favorite from the uh, series of uh, Virgin, Calico, Cascadia. It's my favorite for solo play. Cascadia is my favorite for multiplayer play, but I still love the solo mode as well, and Verdant as well. I still love the solo mode as well. All of them are just really fun solo challenges and puzzles, and not the only kind. I have a mix of different types of games in this video of the top 10 solo games. I have a mix of different things that all hit different styles and approaches of play, uh, but Calico is, is my number 10. I think arguably be probably closer to somewhere in the range of, like, you know, the five to nine range, except I have played through all of these, which means right now I'm kind of, I'm currently going through Cascadia and Verdant because I haven't fully played all of their challenges yet. And so that's why I'm with these games. And that's going to be Calico, which means that is our number 10 pick. Our number nine pick is going to be Under Falling Skies. I think Under Falling Skies was in my video three years ago. I'd have to double check the video. I'm not certain, but Under Falling Skies from CGE, technically a one plus player game, but it's one plus in the same way that any solo game is one plus. Sure, you can have multiple people around the table, all comparing notes and then making a decision together. Under Falling Skies has you rolling dice and allocating them to different sections on your base. You're going to basically have alien invaders. So you have all these aliens who are slowly approaching your base, and you're trying to place your dice here to be able to unlock more areas, to be able to shoot down planes from the sky, to be able to increase your research level, because that's ultimately how you win, increasing the research level so you can figure out how to defeat all the aliens. It's basically Independence Day in a box, and it's such a ridiculously good game. It started as a print-and-play, and then it became a paper. It's picked up by CG. They uh, deluxified the presentation. I don't know if they made tweaks to the rules. I never played the original. They added a campaign mode to it, so there is a full campaign to dive into. I haven't seen an expansion for this one, I'm curious how well it's done for CGE that there has not been an expansion for this game. Uh, or also, I don't know if the game necessarily needs an expansion. What would it be? Like another campaign mode? Some more cards and characters? They've done promo stuff for it, so there is that. But Under Falling Skies is a dice management, dice allocation puzzle for one player, or one plus players, the same way any game on this table could be one plus player. But it's a, solo, it's a dice allocation puzzle as you roll dice, try to figure out how to place them and how to mitigate what's going on in the game and slowly reduce the alien smashy taking you down and it gets brutally challenging which is very satisfying the game can start off easy but gets harder and harder to go and there is difficulty modification in play the way you flip the boards it's just a very good time if you like little optimization puzzles under falling skies has that for you number eight for me is trailblazers trailblazers is the newest one on the list for me i think i can say that trailblazers is the newest one on the list for me this is one that i Enjoy it multiplayer, but I enjoy it just as much solo. But like this for the first one, this is the first, no, actually, I mean, Calico, I enjoy multiplayer and just as much solo as well. So honestly, they're all doing fine so far. Trailblazers is from Bitewing Games, and this is the game of making trails. Designed by Ryan Courtney, what you're doing in the game is you're going to have these different trails over here. These are cards that you're going to be taking. You're going to be drafting these cards, although in solo, you're not drafting the cards so much as just taking sets of cards from the deck, and you're taking from a, a smaller and smaller pool each time. So you draw eight cards, pick two. 
discard the six. Draw six cards, pick two, discard the set the four, and rinse and repeat until you're down to it, trying to place those cards into your board into your tableau in order to achieve one of a variety of different scoring modes in this game because the game has so many different ways to play there's the core game there's also the uh the animals expansion there's the riders expansion which changes the way you play the game then there's playing a solo the solo has a plain solo mode which is about getting points it also has a solo mode which is about getting points and achieving challenges similar to calico and it has the same vibe and i've i've done horribly i have not beaten them all yet i've beaten like one or two of them so far but it's a solo mode that's giving you challenges and your goal is to beat those challenges while getting 50 points which is hard then there's additional solo mode for the um for the rider solo mode plus this is the epic solo mode there are so many ways to engage with this game and it does so in 15 minutes it's fast you can knock out if you're ever if you're someone like me who actually like likes to actively log their plays and likes to gamify that process if there's ever a day where i'm like you know what i didn't get enough games played today i could sit down for an hour play trailblazers and boom i just got five plays in my belt i'm good to go not that you should treat your games that way that seems like it's probably a bit addictive it might be a problem and something to be looked at but um if you are that personality which you shouldn't be and i'm totally not then you can do something like that. Trailblazers is excellent for Bitewing games. I I, I I love it. I the first the first week I got it, I got more than twelve plays in my belt in that first week. I did a full twelve by twelve review just because of how into the game I was, how quick, easy, accessible, and rewarding it was, both playing it multiplayer and solo mode. I don't know. I might prefer solo. I'm not certain. I'd have to play it more. I might prefer solo, but I like it always. That's going to be Trailblazers. My number seven is where you see where the other, I told you there's more than 10 games on this list, and my number seven is going to be a grouping of games, and that specifically is going to be my favorite button shy solo games. Now I'm gonna go through all of these fairly briefly, but I did select a bunch, and they are not all equal here. They're not all equal. My favorites here are probably Numsters, Sprawlopolis, and Ancient Realms, or possibly Numsters, Natureopolis, and Ancient Realms, maybe, possibly, I don't know. But either way, these are all a bunch of button shy solo games, and these are going to be my number spot. I'm gonna, you know, you know, we're gonna team take Numsters out. I'm gonna go with Numsters and Sprawlopolis as my favorite picks, and the others being secondary. Now I have a lot of button shy games that I like. I've talked about them in the past. There's uh, multiplayer button shy games, there's two player button shy games, there's solo button shy button button shy games. And these over here are my favorites from those. But I'll go through them in order of least to most, starting off with Food Chain Island. Food Chain Island is my least favorite from these, but it's still an enjoyable time. The only reason it's here, though, is because of the grace of its brothers and sisters. Otherwise, it wouldn't be present on this list. But I kind of was able to sneak it in once I'm doing a bunch of button shy games as my number seven pick. And in Rove, it's a tactical puzzle as you try to move the, the modules around, you're trying to move these rovers around, trying to collect different things as you try. Sorry, Wrong game. In Food Chain Island, what you're trying to do is you're trying to have the animals eat each other in sequence so that ideally you end up with one card left. Think of it as solitaire, but solitaire with a bunch of animals and uh, different abilities and different sequences as far as how it goes, random setup, all that stuff. And so overall, very satisfying experience. The game gives you a bunch of expansions to mix it up, but it's a great little solo puzzle. It's a little much for like playing on an airplane because you need the table space for it, but are looking for a travel game, a travel solo game to keep you occupied. And if you uh, didn't get enough plays of trailblazers under your belt, uh, you know, Food Chain Island will have you covered. From there, Rove is probably my least favorite after that. Rove would also be the one that's arguably possibly not on this list, but here by the grace of its uh, brothers and sisters. And again, you're trying to walk around getting these modules and trying to set these patterns. It's not really getting modules, it's trying to create these patterns. You're gonna have a sequence of a journey and the journey is going to give you, hey, you have to get everything in that cycle. But the way you move things around, that's all going to take movement points. And he's trying to use the various abilities of these modules and use the movement points. Again, a bunch of expansions mixed in as well. But again, a little bit of a tactical puzzle. I find they're a little bit more clever than Rove than Food Chain Island. Food Chain Island is if I want something a little less brain or burnery, and Rove is if I want something a bit more brain burnery, but they fall into the same spot. Then from there, we have, uh, let's go with Natureopolis next over here. Nature, not Numsters, I'm saying the wrong games all the time. Numsters over here is going to be the next one. Numsters is going to be a hand management puzzle. This is great for a plane. I just played this uh, four or five times on a flight last week. This is, this is basically trying to deal with a handful of cards, and then trying to use that handful of cards to have the numbers eat each other. Effectively, the, the whole entire game is based on the principle of 7, 8, 9. Why was, seven af why was 9 afraid of 7 or whatever it was? Because 7, 8, 9. And so what you're doing is you're trying to have the numbers 8 each other. You use the 8, and the 8 has to be the central number as you rearrange your hand, and you're trying to effectively get down to only two cards left. The 8, and then whatever card is the last one that ate something. So if you're down to, like, you know, a 1, 8, 3, then you'll be able to use the 1, 2, 8, the 3, and you're left with just 1, and boom, you're good. But then what adds to the game is on the back of the rule book, there's a little bit of a way you can check mark what's your final number. I mean, the goal ideally is to end with every single number in play, except for eight, because it's always in play. And so that means you can not just try to play and win the game, but you can try to play and win the game with an additional little mini game going on of how to ensure you have all the various numbers in play as you go through it. 
Then from there, we're going to go with the two, uh, uh, again, Sprawlopolis in general is a system. You know what? I don't know. Let's go with Sprawlopolis, Naturopolis, and Comboopolis over here. I didn't actually have Agropolis over here. I should have them all. So I think I have Comboopolis. But this is the entire system. Started with Sprawlopolis, pro arguably the game that made Button Shy famous. This is a card laying game where you're laying cards over each other or next to each other in order to fit three different objectives. You can have three objectives that are mixed and taken from those cards. So the objectives are very varied every single time you play, giving you different things to strive for as you go through it. This is a system that's similar to what they have in Circle the Wagons, but Circle the Wagons is a two-player drafting game. This, on the other hand, is a solo game, although playable too, but really a solo game. But what you're going to do is you're trying to overlay those cards, and then you have Naturopolis and Agropolis, which give different themes and scoring things and slight differences to the way they operate, and finally Comboopolis, which lets you combine them all in different ways. They're a great system of games. I think Sprawlopolis is still my, like, my, I mean, it's the one I play the most, no question. So, in terms of if we're looking at play count, Sprawlopolis wins there. If you're looking by other factors, such as trying to keep these boxes up. I'm trying to put three as one, which is a problem. But yeah, if you're looking at other factors, I don't know. Naturopolis is one that's currently I'm jiving with the most, but I, ha I have so many plays of Sprawlopolis under my belt that I can't fairly compare it to Naturopolis, which is new and fresh. And then we have Ancient Realm. This is my recent discovery from them. Uh, not my recent discovery. This is my newest discovery. Not mine. It's not my discovery. It's a game I found. I didn't find it. A game I played. There we go. A game I played by uh, Stephen Armani. Same design as Sprawlopolis. From Buttonshy as well. Ancient Realms is a civ building solo game. You're trying to overlay cards on top of each other to activate cards. So whenever you take a card, you're not just activating the cards below it, but you're effectively setting yourself up for which cards you're going to activate. Not necessarily next, but what possible card combinations you have to activate. I find this delightfully challenging. The only thing holding it back for me right now is that right now it's not so much goal-based, which is the way I prefer things. I prefer things to be uh, very goal-based, the way you've seen in Trailblazers and Calico. Uh, even in, in Sprawlopolis, while it is point-based, it's point-based based on variable goals, so it still works as far as goal-based, because right now Ancient Realms is purely goal-based, and that does take away a little bit for it from me. I kind of want some sort of, you know, get this many points, but also do these things along the way. That's what I want from the system right now, but I love it past that. It's such a delightfully satisfying little solo puzzle, could probably be played on a plane. It could arguably get tight depending on how you build it your board, but I think it would probably be fine on most uh most plane trade tables. And then from there we're gonna move to my number six. My number six is a big box I have to try to grab over here. My number six is bear with me. And number six may one day find itself in the same position as Mage Knight, because this currently is Marvel Champions. This is my uh, collection, or I should say box one of two, plus like the three or four boxes I haven't even uh, sorted yet, plus all the various Marvel Champions stuff I have not purchased yet, because I finally stopped purchasing Marvel Champions because I'm so behind on playing it all that I just don't need the consistent hit of new stuff. But Marvel Champions is a delightful game that I... I don't know. I, I, the, uh, the I don't know part is, is not about the game. The I don't know is, do I prefer a two-player? I definitely don't prefer a three or four. There's a case to be made of me preferring a two-player, but also just playing a two-handed works as well. So, And most of my plays of Marvel Champions have been solo. I just know that when I do get to play a two-player with somebody who knows the game and appreciates the game, you can have a really good time. But Marvel Champions is a LCG, a limited collectible game coming from Fantasy Flight, bringing you the Marvel Universe. And what you're going to do is you're going to be building out your decks from a non-collectible set of cards. Every month, the new packs are released. You go ahead and use those cards to build your decks, to put together some sort of way to take down the uh, enemy you're trying to take down. And it is cooperative. You're not fighting each other. You're fighting the various baddies along the way. Then there's all this campaign mode, there's scenarios, there's characters, there's a million different things. And again, I have two full boxes of this, and I can easily justify a third. I need to go ahead and build my third. I have it somewhere off the side, but there's so much Marvel Champion stuff, and there's so much content for the game. I don't play it nearly enough to benefit from that content, but I do play the game, and I do like the game, and I do enjoy the game. It is tactically rewarding. The game I'm looking forward to the most. In fact, I almost wanted to push off doing my solo video to this game coming out, because I think it would make the cut, but Primal. Primal is a game that has a very similar gameplay system to Marvel Champions in terms of the fact that you have hands of cards, but the cards are both the economy for other cards while the actions themselves. And so every time you have a hand of cards, you're trying to figure out which um, what cards am I using for my hand versus what cards am I giving up. That sense of tension is something I love very much in Terraforming Mars as well. Terraforming Mars, which is not on this list, it does have a great solo play, but I prefer it multiplayer, so didn't make the cut over here. But Terraforming Mars has that same principle of like you have hands of cards, you're just constantly choosing what you're able to actually make work. And that concept makes every decision so delightfully tense in both Marvel Champions, in Primal, in Terraforming Mars. I love that system. Combine it with the Marvel IP, with a good, a good art, good production, presentation, all that stuff. And over here, we have Marvel Champions, one of my favorite experiences to go ahead and go through. And I'm realizing now, I'm going to have to go ahead and move this to this side because I will cause issues if I try to uh, adjust this stack. We, we have, I don't know if you noticed earlier, we, we lost a, a button shot game on the floor. It's going to be gone forever. That's my number five. My number six. 
which means we're down to the final five. We are halfway through the list. And if it doesn't feel like we're halfway through the list, it's because technically we have like seven button shies, two bonus picks, things like that. But my number five is for Northwood. And it feels, it feels bad to put this above Marvel Champions, but right now I'm really liking 4 Northwood, and right now, this past year, I've played 4 Northwood more times than I've played Marvel Champions, so for right now, 4 Northwood does get that pick. 4 Northwood is a solo trick-taking game, and I love the puzzle. I love the puzzle of it. In the game, you're going through a trick-taking experience. You have these eight, I think it's eight, uh, you know, various kings or people you're trying to defeat, the various, not really king, you're trying to negotiate with these leaders of eight different regions. And every time you do so, you're going to earn their, their abilities for future conflicts that you have with other leaders, but you're trying to effectively beat these tricks, and everyone has the ways that they're trying to operate and work, but each kingdom has a different number of tricks that you want to win, and so you're trying to vie for, you know, obviously the winning all the tricks and winning none of the tricks is the hardest because you have to de delicately pick which hand you think works for that but even anything in the middle you're trying to go for a precise exact management while using various abilities of characters along the way the game gives you so much variability to the way you have different starting characters if you have like i think it's kickstarter version of this in terms of if you have say kickstarter version of this anywhere i don't know for sure I don't know if this is specifically a deluxe version or in general, but they have not just the, the basic cards, they have more cards, all these various royals in them. I think there's like 24 royals in the game, I think, I have to double check, and you're only using a selection of 12 in any individual scenario, and so you have a wide degree of variability of what gets mixed in, and which ones your starting royals are, because your starting royals are going to be used so much more than the various royals you go ahead and influence and negotiate with, and then make deals for and try to use their powers. And so that means every single time you play this game, there's a different challenge. There's also a little campaign book of different scenarios you can go through, but ultimately it's a solo trick-taking challenge. And if you're like, would the solo trick taking even work? Well, if the answer is this game, then the answer is yes, because this game works. It is a puzzle to pair up the cards you need to try to figure out how to use your abilities, to try to predict how the deck's going to play out and feel like you have perfect control, even though you can be hit with things that come out of the blue for you. For Northwood is one of my highlights of this year for sure, and an easy contender for this list. My number four. I lied. I lied earlier. I said Under Falling Skies is the newest to this list, and there's an argument to be made that Under Falling Skies is... The, no, I said Trailblazers is the newest one to this list, and there's an argument to be made that Trailblazers is, is the newest, there's also an argument to be made that Ancient Realms is the newest, and there's also an argument to be made that 20 Strong is the newest one to this list at number 4. The only reason I wouldn't make that argument is I played 20 Strong before Ancient Realms and before Trailblazers, granted it was a prototype copy, so that's why I think of it as being. But if in terms of pure most recentness to my collection, 20 Strong is the most recent thing here. And even this, even this is a pre-production copy that is not final. 20 Strong from Chip Theory Games. There are two games. I've been pushing off doing a solo video for a long time now. It's been on my list to redo my top 10 solo games for easily six months plus. And then I kept on waiting because I was like, you know what? I know 20 Strong is coming. I know Primal is coming. I'll just wait because I think those are both contenders. I can't keep waiting forever. So Primal will have to wait for another three years from now when I next do my solo lists. But 20 Strong made the cut. By doing so, by the way, it also gave me the opportunity to include Trailblazers and uh, Ancient Realms. And arguably for Northwood, depending on how far back I would have done this video, but 20 Strong made the cut. I've played this game uh, 10 times or so in the, I don't know, uh, three weeks since I've had this. I've played this game a decent amount. I have multiple ga multiple film gameplays on the channel. Actually, I should say I have one film gameplay on the channel and other film gameplays coming to the channel. And I have... I, it's such a good experience. Right now, there's three decks to the system. There's Solar Sentinels, which is the base 20 Strong deck. There's Hop Marcus, and there's Too Many Bones. And the core concept of 20 Strong is you're rolling dice, allocating them towards your adventures, trying to ensure that you can power yourself up more and get your recovery stats back up and get what you need back up so you can ultimately achieve what you need before running out of resources. It's all about trying to... It's all about understanding that you're running towards a cliff and you are slowly running out of steam and you're slowly running out of opportunity to utilize these resources. But if you can do the right things along the way, you can get your engine up in gear fast enough that you not only stop losing, but you start setting yourself up for the win as well. Each game has slight differences to the ways they operate. Solar Sentinels is going to be the most straightforward, but even then, the missions they have, which are optional, the missions, though, give you a clever little additional twist as far as how you engage with them. Hopamachus is going to have you dancing around from location to location, as in Hopamachus. It has that feel to it, while engaging in three different types of adventures, challenges and uh, death matches. Uh, I think it's called death matches, called something else, blood fights, whatever it is called, as well as uh, sports arenas matches. I'm forgetting all the names here. We have the three different challenge types. Uh, Too Many Bones is going to have you going through a sequence of encounters as you fight 
stacks of increasing numbers of baddies, hoping you've leveled yourself up enough that you can take them on. It's very, it's very challenging. There's more and more baddies every single turn, and you choose which stack to engage with, but you also choose these other tyrant encounters and lock picking events and all these other things until eventually you take down the big bad or don't take down the big bad. The games are all challenging in different ways, and they all have ways to level up the game if you're finding it too easy. But along the way, you have your dice, you have your character, which picked from a pool of different characters. You have your dice pool, which is going to be managed and mitigated the entire time as you level up your stats. It is a delightfully good time with a high degree of variability. Each of the experiences feels noticeably different from each other while having enough core overlap. I'm excited for everything they do with this system because 20 strong is so far delightful and I want to see where the system can go. They're also going to have Tangle was coming out, a set of three decks from Mandy Trembley that are not even in the Chip Theory Games universe, but are still being brought to the table. There's a lot to be done with 20 Strong, and it's very, very cool, and I'm excited to see where it goes, what they build. I, I like it a lot. It's my number four pick of my number four solo game of all time, as of right now. My number three is a game that has been on my original list, and that is Spirit Island. Now, I have Jagged Earth in front of me here. No particular reason. It's just the first box I grabbed. But there's Jagged Island, there's Nature, there's, there's uh, Spirit Island, there's Nature Incarnate, there's Jagged Island, there's Branch and Claw. There's all these different expansions for Spirit Island, and I've only played some of the expansions. But Spirit Island is the game that made me realize solo gaming could be something that I loved. There were a lot of solo games that I tried before Spirit Island, and they all felt like puzzly. In a way that I enjoy now, but they didn't necessarily give me that same vibe. I didn't get the same sense of, of heavy gaming from solo games until I played Spirit Island, and I was like, this... This is why people play solo games. This is why people are obsessed with this hobby and this section of the hobby. Because I sat down one day, there was just we had our game night. Every single Thursday, we had game night for years on end. And one day, no one showed up. And I was like, I don't care. I'm having game night. Because I said Thursday night is game night. And so I pulled out Spirit Island. I played a single board. And I understood the appeal. Not a Spirit Island. I already knew the appeal of Spirit Island. I played Spirit Island cooperatively already and enjoyed it. But I understood the appeal. I was like, that was a puzzle. That was satisfying. That was something that was mentally stimulating to go through that process myself. I mean, sure, we did it as a team before, but like doing it myself was just as mentally stimulating. Spirit Island at this point is a game that I very much enjoy it at two players. I very much enjoy it at solo. Three players is already, it's good, but it's a step back from solo or two players for me and four starts getting into chaos. But I love Spirit Island cooperatively or solo. I enjoy the game very much. And I enjoy what the expansions have added, or at least the expansions I've seen. The vast variety of characters in the game. You're basically trying to stop the invaders from coming to the island. You're trying to protect the Dahan. And you have different boards, depending on if you're multi-handing it. You could multi-hand it. I've done it. I've done pure solo. I've also done multi, uh, multi-handing it as well. It's called... It's not called multi-handing it, is it? It's called something else. I don't remember what it's called. Lead the way, I've played multiple characters at once, and I've, I've, I've had so much satisfaction from the puzzle of leveling up your spirit, building out their decks, finding their own unique ways that they can add to the chaos, to the fear, to the damage of the island in a good way, because you're damaging the invaders and you're scaring the invaders, pushing them away as you protect and navigate the Han, as you use the Han for your own advantage, moving them around the board, well, for your own advantage, but really for their advantage, because ultimately, you're doing it to protect them, you're doing it for their interest. There's so much going on, there's so much complexity. It's a game that solved, so to speak, the alpha player problem, because because there's so much going on that this is a game I generally prefer to do it playing a single character true solo because it's so hard to mentally keep in mind what's going on with two characters and that's true when you're playing the full game. The combination of the fear cards coming out and the way they pop out and randomly to a certain extent and the fact that you also have just so much complexity in the characters means that this is a game where you can't really go like you can't tell people what to do on their turn. You have to just do the best you can and hope you're able to defeat the invaders enough and keep things protected enough and hold out long enough that you eventually terrify them away from the island which will happen. One of the things I love about Spirit Island is the fact that the game always feels like you're going to lose, even when you're winning, which means it gives you that, that high of, of feeling like you overcame a challenge, even if it wasn't that much of a challenge. Even if you don't realize it, but you were always in control, you just didn't sense that level of control. It could be a metaphor for our own lives, honestly. But, and if you do start to realize that the challenge is not as hard as you thought it was, that you're winning everything, there are so many ways to escalate and elevate the level of decisions, the level of complexity, the level of how much is going on. Spirit Island is just so good. But, it's not as good as my number two pick. Which I have to get to now. Which is... Uh, unsettled. Unsettled from Orange Nebula Games is my number two pick. And it's a game that I wrestled whether this deserved my number two pick. I did wrestle with that because I haven't played Unsettled nearly as much as many games on the table. I've played 20 Strong more than Settled. I've played Spirit Island more. I've played Marvel Champions more. I've played most of the Button Shies more. I've played Trailblazers more. I've played Under Falling Skies more. I've played Kalu. Every, every single game. Every single game. Mage Knight perhaps not. 
Mage Knight's the only one that I may not have played more than Unsettled, but that's not even on the list, that's a bonus pick. So Unsettled is the least played game, with the possible exception of Mage Knight, from any other game on this list. I don't know exactly how many plays I have, but it's under 10, which makes it the least played game on this list. But it's so satisfying. And it's satisfying in a way that tells a story, and it's it's great to play it solo, it's great to play it more players, and that's another thing I debate about, because this is one where I, I do prefer playing Unsettled with more players, I do. But I like the game enough that I, 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 I had to have on this list. I've played this game solo plenty of times as well, and it's such a good experience. It's a, a tactical puzzle. Vindication is one of my favorite games of all time, from Orange Nebula as well. And Unsettled gives you that puzzly feeling, but it does so while doing so in a cooperative and or solo environment, which is just very different. And it does so while improving the degree of story and immersion and the humor of being lost in whatever deserted planet that you are trying to explore. The game presents a general concept, general puzzle of you're trying to explore these planets. There are core rules in place, you have to follow the core rules, but every planet has different things going on. And so you find a planet, and then each planet has different scenarios you can go through. So even when you find a planet, even as you get used to what a planet is, there's still different reasons why you're visiting that planet at any given point in time, and so things continuously change. There's three levels. There's the game, the planet, and then the individual scenario, and those all give you different ways or things to think about as you engage with the game. It also allows for the opportunity for players to have a full planet, and then just get a different set of objectives that are given out in expansions that give you more gameplay to existing planet structures at play. This is a game that is all about the puzzle. You're trying to survive. You're trying to manage your dice, you're trying to manage your resources, you're trying to manage everything in the game while being mindful of time running out, while being mindful of what tools and abilities and things, you're going to find abilities all along the way, you're going to craft stations you can utilize, you're going to find cards that give you different things, you're going to slowly unlock proficiencies and masteries that give you more stuff that you can do things that are unique and different and allow you to manipulate the board state in front of you, to manipulate the things you need to do in order to achieve the win, which is where it's so satisfying. This game feels like someone just handed you an entire box full of powers and abilities for you to puzzle through what the best way to survive in space is. I adore Unsettled. I straight up adore Unsettled. It is, I, I mean, I adore Vindication more. Vindication is higher for me, but Vindication is not on this list because this is a solo list for me, and Unsettled is so very good. I'm looking forward to what Orange Nebula does next. I know they have Spirit Fire coming out soon, so Spirit Fire is one that I'm definitely keeping my, my eyes peeled for. I want to see where that one goes because so far, they have made two of my favorite games of all time. They've done a lot of, a lot of good stuff. And my number one pick. My number one pick, though, is the only company that has two games on this list. And honestly, they almost had three. Burn Cycle was one that I was debating. But instead, Too Many Bones, not specifically Unbreakable, I just have the smaller box here. Too Many Bones, from Chip Theory Games, who've done 20 Strong, is the only company that has two games on this list. Well, unless you can't count Button Shy, they have like seven games on this list. So that's not really entirely fair. But Too Many Bones is amazing. Too Many Bones gives you such a incredible experience. And most of my plays of Too Many Bones have been solo. I'd say maybe 70, 80% of my plays have been solo as I go through this experience. And then I enjoy playing with two. I think I've played it three players once. I don't know if I've ever played it four. I'd have to look at my logs or whatnot. But Too Many Bones gives you one of the best experiences I've ever received in terms of the ways you can have intricate characters, giving you a smorgasbord of powers and abilities, giving you different ways to approach how you level up the characters, how you approach the game state, how you try to overcome the various baddies in your way, as you work your way through just too many characters, too many enemies, and you try to level yourself up, you try to power yourself up, and every character has their own twist on how they operate, and each character gives you their own little puzzle of what they're doing, and those puzzles are all so satisfying. Learning a new character in Too Many Bones is the equivalent of learning many new entire games, and if that scares you off, there's a chance that it should. It is not an easy game to pick up. It is not a accessible game to pick up. It is a complicated game. It has a rulebook that is manageable, but is a lot to understand. It is not the hardest if you have someone holding your hand through it. If you're playing with somebody else who knows the system and they're running things to a degree, you can often get enough of the system that you can go ahead and fu have fun with it, while not necessarily fully understanding all the concepts at play yet. And that might be the best way to start off. I don't know. I started off by setting up on the table, powering through a rule book for like four hours and continuously trying to plug away at it and eventually getting it and then seeing the charm behind this game. Seeing the reason so many people are in love with the Too Many Bones system and I am very much one of those people. Too Many Bones gives you character depth, gives you character variability, gives you scenario variability. The amount of these uh, little missions or encounters you go on in the game, there's so much going on, gives you expansion variability as far as different things you can add in, tweak, adjust, 
There's so much going on in this game, but the depth of the characters and the ways they operate and the puzzle you are facing off against while you try to tackle various enemies who range in the difficulty of how bad or hard they are, Too Many Bones is a game that I'm absolutely in love with. Like many others on this list too. Honestly, the top four here are killer. The top, the top four, 20 Strong, Spirit Island, Unsettled, Too Many Bones. The rest of them are great too, make no mistake. This is, this is a list of my favorite solo games for a reason. Ultimately, these right now are my 10 favorite solo games. There are things coming that will challenge this list. There are things coming. There's, I mean, even we have Elder Scrolls coming from Chip 3 Games. Burn Cycle narrowly missed the list. It's such a good solo experience. We have uh, Agamonia, which I think would do better with more than once. I don't know if that's going to make a solo list. But we also have Iridia. Iridia is an excellent game, both solo and multiplayer. A lot going on it. We have Primal, like I've mentioned already, which should really challenge whether what gets kicked off the list in favor of Primal. And those are just the big box experiences. We're not even talking about the any number of games like uh, Four Northwood that show up on my doorstep without me having Haver ever had it on my radar there are so many amazing incredible experiences out there these are just my current top 10 until next time i'm alex radcliffe from board game co hope you found this video useful or helpful in some way and as always i hope you have a good one